Guten Tag, genau. Auf meinem Kanal spreche ich über arme Menschen. Tam, где я живу, если кто-то говорит на другом языке, обычно это испанский. А вы, масса спецификаменты, это испанил, который я говорю в Лос Пейсах, в Мехико, в Андорес, в и Колумбии. Города, Коношлан, Башка, Дилайдивар. Они же пробовали к мою роту лени, не им туда мерт. Ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of clarity and sanity, the rest of this movie will not be in Polish. In the United States, foreign languages, well, anything other than English has a varied history depending on which one you're talking about. Add in socioeconomic status, regional dialect, and there's even more layers. For this video, this is going to focus on English within the US, but we'll briefly touch on the Spanish language. Languages outside of English will be in a video or videos down the line because not all languages in the US are treated the same. Each has their own history and deserve their own focus. Feel free to like, subscribe, ring the bell. As always, be respectful in the comments and other creators. With Mothra the Bunny of Data Science at her side, Ben Conmigo. Alright, after autumn. Ask anyone around the area about accuracy. Arctic activities are abundant, astonishing, astounding, and A1 on all accounts. Back up. But before beach bodies, bros better bundle up in boots, blankets, and balaclavas because a bloody bitter breeze will blow brisk, blustery, and bleak. Careful. Correct and common to cocoon in a cap coat and comforter because a cut and cold can consume your character, occasionally create a corpse, and continually compress your cock. In a previous video, I discussed how the type of media consumed often reflects the economic and cultural background that we come from. To build on that, this influences the language we use and the education we have access to. In turn, our socioeconomic background is reflected in the results for standardized tests, college entrance exams, and certain military exams. Young man, let me ask you a question. Why do you want to go to the Bronx Academy of Science? Because that's where my friend's going. Because I love science. Why do you love science? Because it's in the name of your school. Because I like to cut frogs open. Klingons? <laughs> Mr. Perkins. If you don't let me in, she'll smack the scholastic out of you. Let's start with standardized tests for college entrance, the SAT and ACT. In the 2021 article from visitdays.com, the response to the question, why are colleges and universities considering tests optional, quote, one of the main reasons is because of the known correlation between socioeconomic status and standardized test scores. Students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds tend to have lower SAT and ACT scores. This can be attributed to the cost to prepare for and take the test multiple times and the potential lack of academic support that low-income students receive, end quote. As of 2023, the cost to take the ACT without the writing section is $66, $91 with the writing section as well as the additional fee of $25 if you change your mind one way or the other on that written section. In general, most colleges and universities do not require the written section even though the ACT website recommends this. Of course, they're going to recommend an option that makes them more money. This isn't even including the additional fees such as late registration, standby, or adding an additional two colleges to send your test scores to. That said, there is a waiver program but I had to create an account in order to see what that included, and I'm not a current student, so I'm not sure how easy or difficult it is to obtain this assistance. The SAT isn't much cheaper with the registration fee of $60 and many of the same multiple additional fees. Again, there is a fee waiver, but I'm unable to speak on the accessibility without creating an account. The reason I mention both is that depending on the institution, they may require one test or the other, but most allow both. When applying for school, students are advised to take it more than once because the score will usually increase each time, generally speaking. Again, additional costs, and even with the waiver, the ACT limits it to two free attempts. No pressure. Here's how the numbers shake out in parts of Chicago. The top five most affected areas are at number one, the Austin neighborhood, followed by South Lawndale, Belmont Cragen, Humboldt Park, and South Shore. These are areas that have also been hit hard by the virus, which means students in those communities will be at a huge disadvantage even when they eventually go back to class. The money to take these tests are a significant amount of money to a poor family. It's about a tank and a half of gas or a week's worth of groceries for a small family if it is stretched quite thin. One of the best ways to improve your score is to take the test repeatedly because it's not so much intelligence as it is recognizing what the test is asking for and picking up on those patterns. There are free resources at libraries online, but in the article's link below, about 12 million students don't have access to the internet. This does mention the information includes phones or tablets, but clarifies that the items do not function at a sufficient level to be used as an aid for education, 
due to factors such as body reception or caps on data plans. While that number is declining, according to the Department of Education, there are approximately 49.5 million kids in public schools, and 12 million of that is about 24%. That means nearly one out of every four kids will have to go to a public library, use the internet at school, or find another means to access reliable internet. This is at the same time as some states are cutting funding for libraries and banning books. When it comes to poor families and access to the internet, there are a few reasons for this. Some rely on their phones to be a mobile hotspot, and again, usage and data plans may apply. Some households still have dial-up and upgrading would be outside of their budget. For those in rural areas, there is also the challenge of no service providers available whatsoever. There are a handful of companies that offer satellite internet, but this is often spotty and sometimes the same speed as dial-up. Most web pages and search engines require speeds that these meager services just cannot process quickly. This was especially difficult during the pandemic when 53% of families said that their child had times when they were unable to participate in school activities or finish work. Not to mention that about 1 in 8 kids don't have a computer at home. Just another barrier to make it more difficult to get through practice and training for the ACT. In the description, I've linked the article from NewAmerica.org that further breaks down the issues with connectivity and education in the U.S. Tuesday morning at Francis Marion School in the central Alabama city of Marion. A handful of students are in class. Some information in this speech is missing. Officials suspended in-person learning last year because of the threat of coronavirus, but many students are still here two days a week because they can't get online at home, and neither can some of their teachers. I mention all this because the majority of the ACT and SAT focus on reading, writing, and language. For the ACT, it is two of the three sections, and for the SAT, it's three of the five sections. So if access to resources is low and quality of education subpar, it's going to be a struggle for many lower socioeconomic levels. The more barriers a student has to overcome just to catch up, the harder it will be to enter college if that's a path they choose to take. But what about the military? They'll pay for education, so that can be our fallback, right? The wars of the future will not be fought on a battlefield or at sea. They will be fought in space, or possibly on top of a very tall mountain. In either case, most of the actual fighting will be done by small robots. And as you go forth today, remember always, your duty is clear, to build and maintain those robots. Thank you. It's a bit of a meme that taking the risk to join a branch of the armed forces to pay for college is a common option for the poor. For the military, there is the ASVAB, or Armed Service Vocational Aptitude Battery Test, end quote, helps the Department of Defense not just determine whether you are a good fit to join the service, but also which service branch you might be best for, and even what military jobs you can hold after you finish basic training or boot camp. The better your ASVAB score, the broader your options. On the website military.com, the emphasis on the test is that this determines if you can even enlist. Officer tests are a different thing, I'll leave that out for now. All right, Simpson. I don't like you, and you don't like me. I like you. Um, all right. You like me, but I don't like you. Maybe you would like me if you got to know me. In the article from the Institute of Industrial Economics from 2013, linked below, quote, Historically, the American Armed Forces were disproportionately drawn from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. A transition toward a smaller and more selective military has changed this tendency." End quote. One of the many selling points to get recruits, especially when I was in high school, is that the military would pay for your college and considering the exorbitant cost of higher education, for many this was their best solution. Sure, there's a risk of PTSD, severe injury, or not making it back alive, but it's an option. This is explained further in the article, quote, Recruits from lower socioeconomic backgrounds continue to have stronger incentives to join the military for employment or to finance education. The move toward a smaller and more technologically advanced military has, however, made military recruitment more selective and created a tendency in the opposite direction. Individuals without high school degrees, with criminal records, a poor health record, and those scoring low in skill tests are significantly less likely to be allowed in the military. This has created a powerful force against recruiting from lower socioeconomic backgrounds." End quote. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, by 2017, 90% of adults 25 and over had a GED or high school degree. The question then becomes what was included within their educational background. As mentioned in the video on the cost of higher education, the socioeconomic background of the parents has a higher impact on their academic success than whether or not a student attended private or public school. Since poorer kids are far more likely to attend public school, it is in our best interest to ensure that it is sufficiently and properly funded. In a 2010 press release from the Educational Trust, quote, 
too few of our nation's recent high school graduates, particularly young people of color, have the math, reading, science, and problem-solving skills necessary for enlistment in the U.S. Army, end quote. I will also add that this is the result of the ASVAB test. I am in no way advocating whether or not someone should join the armed forces. This is to illustrate that another possible path to higher education is being cut off from those in the poor and marginalized groups. To explain what I mean by how language and lexicon are affected by economic class, let's take a look at a few questions. In the word knowledge section, they provide these examples. Wilted may be a familiar word, but antagonized may not, or vice versa. If these are words not used in the media they consume or used by the people around them, they are probably just guessing. Then there are words such as quiver that have a different meaning for those from fundamentalist religious backgrounds. If we look at general science, if the applicant's education was lacking in this area because of poor school funding, they may not know that nitrogen is the principal gas in the Earth's atmosphere, or that salt helps melt ice because it lowers the temperature at which water freezes. Then there's the paragraph comprehension, mathematics, assembling objects, mechanical comprehension. A person that grew up helping their parents in the auto shop may excel at the auto information section, but struggle with general science. Let's put all this together before the next section. A child that grows up in poverty is already behind when starting school, which we'll discuss next. They progress through their education and have to put in more effort than their wealthier peers to keep at pace with them. If they can't afford the exam fees for the ACT or SAT and don't qualify for the fee waiver, this path is either delayed or no longer open for them. Even if they save up money or qualify for the waiver, they are limited in the number of attempts to get a high score. They can try taking the exam for the armed services, but if their score is not high enough, they've lost another job opportunity and another chance to pay for higher education. If they don't have a car or access to decent public transportation, they are severely limited in job opportunities. They might be lucky enough to be near a trade school education program or apprenticeship, but there isn't much outside of that besides fast food or retail. Jobs that are notorious for not paying a living wage. A common trope is the fish out of water, where a character switches places such as Freaky Friday or The Prince and the Popper. In The Prince and the Pauper, they trade places so the pauper can live as the royals do and the prince can cosplay as the poor. Even though they have changed clothing and some of their appearance, it is still evident that they don't quite fit in. The way they speak and their mannerisms alert those around them that something is off. They may have the same face, but they are from different class cultures trying to navigate vastly different worlds. Let's go back to where our accent and dialects begin. In the Strategies for Speech Pathologists, they bring up the research from Hart and Risley, quote, Socioeconomic status makes an overwhelming difference in how much talking went on in a family. The family factor most strongly associated with amount of talking was socioeconomic status. They extrapolated that in a 365-day year, children from professional families would have heard 4 million utterances, and children from welfare families would have heard 250,000 utterances. Westby, commenting on this research, states, even by three years of age, the difference in vocabulary knowledge between children from welfare homes is so great that children from welfare homes would require a preschool program for 40 hours per week in which they heard language at a rate heard in the homes of professional families to gain a vocabulary the equivalent of working class children." End quote. So from the beginning, those in poverty are lagging behind the start line before we even account for other factors. It's that much more effort to catch up and be able to participate to the same levels our wealthier peers for tests and later on jobs. If we factor in those who are bilingual or have Spanish as their first language, even more so. Spanish is the official language of about 20 countries, each with their own variation of vocabulary and accent. The United States does not have an official language, however Spanish is the second most common after English with 54 million bilingual or native Spanish speakers. In 2022, the population of the U.S. was roughly 333 million so about 16% speak Spanish. Texas and California being the two states with the highest number of Spanish speakers. Do you know how frustrating it is to have to translate everything in my head before I say it? To have people laugh in my face because I'm struggling to find the words? You should try talking in my shoes from one mile. I think you meant I know what I meant to mean. Do you even know how smart I am in Spanish? Of course you don't. For once, it would be nice to speak to someone in my own language, in my own home. 
Much like how we can't ignore the impact of our socioeconomic background, we can't ignore languages such as Spanish that will interplay with English in different ways at different levels for the use of certain vocabulary, grammatical lexicon, and accent. Spanish is becoming more prevalent and it would behoove us to embrace the linguistic changes this will bring. In the description I've linked creators below such as Intellectual Media, FD Signifier, and T1J that have videos discussing the impact of race on language, slang, culture, and history better than I can. Diablos! Realmente estoy hablando español! <laughs> ¿Qué tal que Mrs. Klein, mi profesor de español, me podía oír? <laughs> Ella siempre decía que yo le podría juntar dos frases. <laughs> Según veo, estaba equivocada. <laughs> ¡Hola! ¡Mucho gusto! Me llamo Elliot. Hola, Juan. Hola, Esteban. ¿Dónde esta es la biblioteca? Not every poor family has an accent in TV shows, and it is dependent on where they are from. For example, in Shameless, the Gallagher family doesn't have a strong accent, partly because they are in Chicago. The Chance family in Raising Hope are in Arizona, and also don't have much of an obvious accent. Contrast this with other shows, such as My Name is Earl, where characters such as Joy speak with a trailer park type accent. And of course, the trailer park boys that have a twist of Canadian in trailer park. This is the cheating piece of trash trumpet who doesn't deserve to have the same last name as you now. That's right. I read your Christmas letters. Cletus and Brandine in The Simpsons have a noticeable southern or hick accent and are portrayed as unintelligent. Hey, Brandine! You can wear that shirt to work! Oh, Cletus, you know I gotta wear the shirt what Dairy Queen give me! I've made several videos regarding Kim Wexler from Better Call Saul. She doesn't have an accent, but learns how to speak the cultural language of the lawyers around her. Schweikert is one of the few lawyers that treats Kim as an equal and doesn't look down on her as opposed to Howard. One of the reasons I think Kim is focused on getting revenge and targeting Howard is that she sees him as too fake. For those in wealthier socioeconomic levels, Howard's saccharine, too bright smile, newscaster tone, and overly complimentary language feeds into the egos of those with money because he knows what they want to hear. This doesn't work as well for those struggling to get by, and Kim mostly sees Howard as untrustworthy and two-faced. Like many of us that grew up in poverty, Kim can put a mask on when she needs to, depending on the setting. In The Simpsons, Cletus and Brandine are both seen as unintelligent. They certainly aren't the only characters stereotyped in this show. For this couple, they're just those poor hicks on the outside of town. In the season 33 episode titled Pretty Little Liar, Brandine is one of the few members of the book club that actually read the book and shocks everyone when she reveals she is actually quite smart. Not only that, but she was self-motivated to read after some books fell on the house after a tornado. By not fitting into the confines of the box that the community has imagined for her, it makes some of those citizens uncomfortable. Cletus is insecure, and at first they separate, so Brandine stays with the Simpsons during that time. After Cletus has time to think, he gets a library card as they show up support to Brandine, and they reconcile. Since it is a sitcom, their characters pretty much go back to the status quo after this. Vocabulary, dialect, and accent affect our language and signal our class. In the 2019 article from PNAS, quote, Although perceivers were able to detect target social class in either spoken or written text, this detection was most likely to occur for spoken text. This suggests that, over and above context, some cues specific to verbal transmission, pronunciation or accent, signal social class. In addition, perceivers not only infer social class from little information, but they also use this categorization to make judgments at about a potential job candidate's fit and competence." End quote. The three theories to detect social class are 1. How close their speech matches certain educational and societal norms. 2. That class can be detected in less than 7 words, and 3. Stereotypes feed into perceptions of fit and competence, which impact outcomes in areas such as hiring practices. From this, it is suggested that trying to blind resumes is not sufficient enough to conceal social class, and as a result, makes it more difficult to move up in the workplace. In the release, Krauss further states, quote, While most hiring managers would deny that a job candidate's social class matters, in reality, the socioeconomic position of an application or their parents is being assessed within the first seconds they speak, a circumstance that limits economic mobility and perpetuates inequality, end quote. Much like how the Cockney accent is seen as lowly, those who speak with a southern drawl are perceived as uneducated yet kinder. In the BBC article linked below, quote, When we examine the reasons why anyone would consider changing their accent, we uncover a raft of biases that shouldn't necessarily be reinforced, end quote. When I'm in a professional setting or recording a video, I focus on downplaying the accent that I have. I started doing this to see if it would affect my ability to advance at work. I hate that it did. 
my coworkers took me more seriously and were less harsh in reviewing output. The work was the same, but because I started masking my speech and vocabulary, suddenly I was viewed differently. I was also heavily masking autistic traits, but that's another video. The negative biases surrounding regional accent will hurt all of us in the long run. From the BBC article, quote, This has had some real-life impacts. For example, there are fewer academics who have kept their regional accents because students somehow just don't find them as effective if they have one, and often rate them accordingly regardless of their actual expertise. Even in job interviews, it is easy for an interviewer to fall into the trap of believing that a person's mere accent is enough to indicate their ability. A surprising 80% of employers admit they do discriminate based on accent, according to recent research. In extreme, though not uncommon cases, people have lost their jobs thanks to these prevailing attitudes, even when their accent had no bearing on the actual work. With such a linguistic minefield to navigate, is it any wonder people consider making their accents over for an easier life? When it comes to the U.S., quote, a southern drawl has become the go-to voice to adopt when ironically mimicking an ignorant opinion, creating a not-so-bright caricature, or put simply, whatever the audience needs to understand that the character is an idiot. The bumbling hillbilly stereotype is so deeply perpetuated in modern media, it's been ingrained in the human psyche that anyone who speaks with a southern accent must therefore be stupid. Accent softening is still being offered as a service because these biases are still heavily ingrained in parts of society. And if you're a woman speaking with a southern accent, you're perceived even further to be less intelligent, as cited in the Stockton University study, Why Are Certain Accents Judged the Way They Are? You son of a biscuit-eating bulldog. What the French toast? Did you think I wouldn't find out about your little doo-doo head cootie queen? Who are you calling a cootie queen, you lint liquor? Pickle you, cumquat! You're overreacting. No, Bill, overreacting was when I put your convertible into a wood chipper. Stinky McStink face! Another sign that can signal your socioeconomic class is use of that foul language. Throwing in too many four-letter words, though not as common of a phrase now, it has in the past also been called blue language, referring to the fact that those in blue-collar jobs would usually speak this way. To quote Stephen Fry, the sort of twee person who thinks swearing is in any way a lack of education or lack of verbal interest is just a fucking lunatic, end quote. There are multiple studies that show people who are more honest curse and that foul language doesn't mean someone is uneducated, but it's going to hurt those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds more because there is a nuance in unspoken social rules that those in poverty likely did not grow up with. This isn't to say workers in an office setting don't curse. A career finder survey reported that 95% report cursing in front of coworkers, 51% in front of their supervisor. But there is a nuance to this, and an office environment can be quite tricky since it can be vastly different than how some of us grew up. Women from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to go to college and intermingle with those from wealthier backgrounds. By doing so, they have a chance to pick up on those subtleties that exist and carry those over into the workplace. Those who don't attend college will have to figure out office politics a different way. Luckily, this is starting to change in some areas. However, being able to navigate within the office successfully will increase the odds of getting a promotion or a raise. Considering all of these biases so far, we haven't yet touched on how disability can affect our speech. It's no secret that those in poverty have less access to decent health care, if any. I'll link the video where I discuss issues with poverty and dental work. Issues with teeth affect speech, which tacks on another hurdle that those in poverty have to deal with on a daily basis. There's also the myth that people who stutter are stupid or nervous, yet there are no links to prove this to be the case. Then there are disabilities such as cerebral palsy that mostly affects motor control and speech. I'll let Erica explain. But it is mostly a, a neuromuscular disorder that really affects motor control like speech, arms and leg movement, just like movement in general. So yeah. A person is not less intelligent if they have this, it's just that it takes slightly longer to be able to communicate their ideas. And in a world where it's advantageous to be able to speak quickly in order to convey our thoughts, it can be another hurdle for some. Since those in poverty have less access to healthcare, they also have less access to resources that could aid their quality of life. This is another reason why we need to consider intersectionality when discussing issues with poverty. Schools need proper funding to provide adequate tools for students to succeed, such as speech pathologists, teachers' aides, and resources for students that are visually and or hearing impaired. Poor school districts often have less resources to provide the needed accommodation for students with disabilities, not to mention biases such as thinking only boys can be autistic or that dyslexia is something the student just needs to get over. 
When there's a movie or TV show about the character overcoming disability and poverty, it's shown to be inspirational, but we should be asking why they had to struggle to the degree that they did to begin with. If you are disabled and in poverty, you have to work harder than those around you. But if you struggle enough, maybe your experience can be exploited and put in a movie. That's not to say that media can't be a source of increasing awareness, but there is certainly room for improvement. In the links below, there are creators that discuss these topics more in depth. In my video on Rags to Riches Stories, I mention the movie Pursuit of Happiness. The struggle is glamorized as an example of what happens if you just keep trying and work hard despite all the obstacles in your way. The movie ends when he gets the job after completing an extremely competitive, unpaid internship. Even after getting the job, he is still going to face difficulties in the office, but will likely succeed because of his ability to adapt and take in new information. Some of the ways he is shown to be intelligent are very stereotypical, but some are more subtle. Similar to how some fairy tales end with the royal couple riding off into the sunset, the audience is not shown what's on the other side after he gets this job. Even if a person manages to appear as if they have escaped their background by altering their speech or appearance, it's difficult to disconnect from our roots. In the movie The Glass Castle, based on the book of the same name, Jeanette lies to her fiancé about who her family is. Even though she presents a certain image, she appears uncomfortable and her trauma is shown in other subconscious ways. For example, her fiancé comments that she still keeps much of her belongings in boxes, and in the movie we are shown the chaotic instability of her family being unable to stay in a house for very long. While she tries to keep a wall between these two worlds, her family reappears quite often. With the increased access to social media, more people have been able to speak out about their experiences. The algorithm may be working against them, but it has not silenced us from speaking out against the issues in education and the workplace. We need to stop assuming someone's intelligence based on how they sound and provide adequate resources to families and schools so that education can improve for everyone. The job application process needs an overhaul for many reasons. The current process is failing businesses and potential employees by using bots to look for keywords and businesses requiring unnecessary numerous interviews. Our resumes shouldn't have to be altered to match arbitrary rules of language, nor should our accents prevent us from receiving a promotion or affect the perception of our credentials. Addressing issues with poverty means analyzing our biases when it comes to language and lexicon in order to eliminate those barriers. Thanks for making it this far. Until next time. Come on back and see me again for some more fun learning. And remember, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Okay? I've got to go now. So long!